accelerated star hopping gradient descent via a new model for first order optimization. Okay. Uh, thanks for the introduction. So my name is Zeyuan. I was a postdoc at uh, Princeton for a year, and I'm now a postdoc here for another year. So uh, I work mostly on optimization, so that means I am more like an applied mathematician. So this talk is about two things. First, about a new method that works on accelerating stochastic gradient descent. And the second half of the talk is about a new model, or actually a new way of thinking, in order to design and analyze first order methods. So let me begin with the first one, okay? So uh, even before that, let me remind you what uh, accelerated uh, gradient descent is. So accelerated gradient descent is a first order method, meaning that it tries to minimize, it, uh, it tries to minimize a convex function, say fx, uh, by making first order queries to the function. That is, at any point x, uh, the method, the algorithm, can compute the first order derivative of the function, which is a vector at this point, and then using that information, he can try to decide where to query next. In a number of queries, then the goal of first order method is to minimize this number of queries in order to eventually produce some output point so that its objective distance to the minimizer is, say, very small, something epsilon-ish. So that is the model of first order method. And in today's talk, for simplicity, I'm assuming the function to be convex and uh, to be smooth, meaning it's Hessian to have a bounded spectral norm. So actually, both of the assumptions can be relaxed, but that will make the talk more complicated. So that's the model of first order method. Then, uh, what is accelerated gradient descent? If I drop the word accelerated, then everyone knows what it is. That's to go in the direction of the negative gradient of the function, and that could help us to move closer and closer to the minimizer of the function. So mathematically, one can prove that the convergence rate is proportional to 1 over t. That is, if I do this procedure t iterations, then the objective distance to the minimizer is proportional to 1 over t. So this constant c is like 2. So don't worry about it. Now, uh, accelerated gradient descent does one more thing fancier on top of gradient descent. That is momentum. So in the first iteration, it does the same thing. But starting from the second iteration, it tries, to it tries to remember how much I have moved in the most recent iteration, and also keeps moving in that direction. In particular, in the second iteration, it tries to also move in the direction of x1 minus x0, and call this new point x2. And then in the new iteration, it does the same thing, negative gradient, the momentum, and uh, on and on. So this is known as uh, accelerated gradient descent, and it converges quadratically faster than gradient descent. This was not my discovery. It was Nastrov's di discovery like back to more than 30 years ago. Very smart, and known as Nastrov's momentum trick. OK? So this momentum trick is actually closely related to the Chebyshev interpolation theory, which I'm happy to talk offline. But it has, it's, it has like some deep math in it. So in today's talk, I want to focus on actually a, one, uh, a more challenging case than gradient descent. That is the stochastic setting. Suppose the function fx this time is explicitly written as a finite average over functions fi, each one being also say convex and smooth for simplicity. In such a case, uh, one typically talks about stochastic gradient descent, meaning that in each iteration, we compute the gradient of a random piece of the function, that is a random fi, for some random i, say, drawn for simplicity uniformly at random between 1 and n. So this is definitely an unbiased estimator of the full gradient of the function, but it's n times cheaper and faster to compute. So therefore, stochastic gradient descent is something that people really love to use. But how does it converge? Pictorially, because I don't really have the time to compute the full gradient, then I can only choose a random stochastic gradient. That's only a random sample, so it has error. But say I choose it and I try to still go there. Then if I continue in this fashion, I can make errors. In particular, see here, maybe I'm making a very bad choice by moving to the left. But still, in some expected sense, this method converges with a convergence rate being 1 over root t. 
which is slower than the 1 over t and the 1 over t squared on the previous slide. So this is definitely not satisfactory. And one can ask, can we improve it to here and to there? So the first question is actually not hard to answer. That is, using some, something not very fancy called variance reduction, one can still recover the 1 over t convergence for stochastic gradient descent. This part I will not go into details today. But what remains open before like, this work I'm going to talk about is regarding how to get even a more challenging goal, that is the 1 over t squared convergence rate, the accelerated convergence rate for stochastic gradient descent. OK? So before I tell you the answer, uh, let's first see something. Yeah, question? So this, what's the uniformity of n? Sorry? So you, you said the convergence is just 1 over square root of t. There's no dependence on n? Uh, so there will be a dependency on n. You will see that, OK? So let's see. So here is one thing that doesn't work. That is, if we naively add momentum on top of stochastic gradient, I claim that it does not work. And here is the rough illustration about why. Remember, stochastic gradients are only rough estimates of the true gradient, so they may be inaccurate. In particular, this one, remember, was a very inaccurate step in one of my, say, stochastic gradient procedures. And now if we do momentum, let me illustrate the effect of this negative uh, of this like uh, very bad move. In the next iteration, this momentum will be remembered. In a actually every single iteration in the future, this bad move is going to be remembered. And uh, one can actually turn this into a mathematical counterexample showing that just using solely momentum on top of stochastic gradient is not going to help. It can at most converge in a 1 over t convergence. And therefore, we need something that's significantly different. But th this was already known before our work. And that was one of the main difficulties behind why like, acceleration was not discovered for stochastic gradient. So it doesn't use time to So it does. So that's a very fair point. Because in expectation, in some sense, we still should have some convergence. But in fact, that convergence is only 1 over t, but not 1 over t squared. OK? Yeah, it's only a uh, very high level hand wavy like illustration. Good point. Yeah. In expectation, we shouldn't expect uh, such a very bad thing to happen, but it still could converge with only a rate 1 over t. So here is one way to get 1 over t squared that I recently discovered. That is, in the first step, the same thing. In the second step, I do momentum, but I don't immediately move there. OK? I compute the midpoint between x0 and that new point. And I call this one x2. It's like adding a very strong magnet on top of x0, and it retracts me back by a factor of 1 half. Actually, any constant factor works as long as we only care about constant uh, loss in the final convergence. So we can do this continuously. In the next step, we do a stochastic gradient, momentum, retract it back. Stochastic gradient, momentum, retract it back. But here is the fancy thing. After every n iterations, I move the location of this magnet. I move it here. And then I continue this same procedure. n is the same n. n is the same n. That's the point. Actually, again, any constant fraction works. Yeah. So this method turns out to, uh, and I actually ended up calling it uh, the Katyusha momentum to distinguish it from the Nastrov momentum, partially because it's a beautiful girl's name, and also it's a Russian name. In any case, so I call the method Katyusha method, and it converges in t squared convergence rate. So yes, there's a factor n showing up here. And uh, nevertheless, it's always going to be faster than stochastic gradient descent, as long as you explore, every, uh, you explore each function, say, at least once in expectation. OK? So this is roughly, from a very high level, what the method looks like. So instead of proving to you how, uh, why this, uh, this, theorem sta uh, this theorem holds, so today I want to, so b by the way, the proof is not that simple. It requires a few pages. But instead, I want to tell you like, how this method was discovered. So it, it actually came out of like, another project I started out with Lorenzo Arecchia back to two summers ago. That we call it a linear coupling framework. 
It's a new framework, a new model for designing first order methods. So let's see what it is. Uh, before like, describing the model, let me remind you of two classical analysis that people use to analyze first order methods. One of them is gradient descent that basically says, if in each iteration I can keep decreasing the objective value, then I could eventually converge to a minimizer of the function. This is pretty much like standard. Everyone knows that. But in fact, there is an orthogonal way to analyze first order methods. That is from a dual site called mirror descent. At every point of the function, I can make a query, compute the, first, uh, compute the derivative. That gives me a lower bound to the function, a linear lower bounding hyperplane. If I make another query, I get another li linear lower bounding hyperplane. And then the whole idea of mirror descent is to intelligently make queries to the function so that the final average of those linear lower bounds become as flat as possible. So this is a very high level and hand wavy description of mirror descent in pictures. So let's now make two very quick observations just from the pictures. In mirror descent, if the gradients we have received are kind of flat already, meaning the gradients being small in whatever norm, say Euclidean norm, then it's very easy to converge. It's very easy to get a final hyperplane that is very flat. And if the gradients are, in contrast, very steep, then it becomes much harder to converge. I summarize this as mirror descent satisfies that if we have small gradients, then that gives faster convergence. And this phenomenon is actually very orthogonal to what is going on in gradient descent. That is, if we have large gradient over there, we could in one step decrease the objective value by a lot. And if we have a relatively smaller gradient, we could decrease it by less. So one could formalize this mathematically, but from a very high level, in these two words, we have very complementary phenomenon. That is, large gradient and small gradient implies faster convergence in either side. So then there's a natural question that is, can we combine the analysis of the two for faster convergence? The answer is yes, and this is what we call the linear coupling framework. So at any point, we could make, say, two descent steps, a gradient descent and a mirror descent step, and then linearly combine the two using a combining ratio that's between 0 and 1 to be tuned very carefully. And if you do it this way, you can recover the t square accelerated convergence rate. But unfortunately, this one does not work in the stochastic setting. So in order for this coupling to work, we have to make sure like the two steps use full information about the exact gradient, but not the randomized stochastic gradient. But fortunately, remember I kept saying that it's the linear coupling framework. It's not actually a single method. It's a framework for designing methods. Meaning that, for instance here, why don't we linearly couple three things? In particular, the one that I chose here is the magnet. If we linearly couple not only the two descent, but also the magnet, which is the integral multiples of n, then this gives accelerated convergence rate, also in the stochastic setting. So this is like from a very high level, what's the, meaning, uh, what's the meaningfulness of this linear coupling framework and how it roughly implies this accelerated convergence rate in the stochastic setting. So it has other applications, and uh, I will conclude here for today's talk. Thank you. <laughs>